Democratic candidates take the stage in Atlanta for presidential debate. And the Georgia State Panthers fall in both of their ranked matchups. All that and more on Panther Report News. Hello and welcome to Panther Report News. I'm Ashton Gates. And I'm Keelan Berrien. Democratic candidates competing to become president made several stops while in Georgia for the Democratic debates. Georgia is home to an increasing number of minority voters and is now seen as the battleground state for the upcoming elections. Minutes after the debates, Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard shows love to her supporters at the Atlanta Music Project. Gabbard's family was present and her father even played a song for the audience. The Congresswoman later spoke with supporters about being on the debate stage. They resort to more of the same smears and lies to try to undermine our campaign. But here's what I think. I think they are stuck in this Washington establishment elite mindset and underestimate you, underestimate the voices of the people in this country across party lines. Billionaire Tom Steyer made a stop for a lunch roundtable with supporters. The candidate heard from African-American women about concerns in Atlanta. PRN's Tyreek Wynn spoke with Steyer after his event and among the policies that he stands for. Steyer tells PRN that addressing climate change ranks number one. So if we actually deal with climate, we can create millions of good paying union jobs everywhere. We have to rebuild the country on an accelerated basis. It's millions and millions of high paying jobs. Senator Bernie Sanders made a stop at Morehouse College as well, speaking to supporters about a range of issues, one of which was addressing racial injustice. So I learned at a very young age what racism and white supremacy and Aryanism and all that crap is about. And our pledge together is we will do everything humanly possible to end all forms of discrimination and Georgia State students helped pull the show together. About 40 students worked the days leading up to the event as production assistants, some even mock candidates. We spoke to one student about this unique experience. It really tapped into my networking skills and my socialization skills with other people and really put me in the thick of production and showed me the true colors of what it takes logistically to create an operation this big. And all of this led up to the reveal. Tyler Perry Studios hosted 10 candidates with MSNBC and the Washington Post for the Democratic debates. The last time Atlanta held a presidential debate was in 1992. PRN's Tariq Wynn has more. The city of Atlanta is hosting the fifth Democratic debate right here at Tyler Perry Studios. Tonight you will see 10 candidates take the debate stage. 10 candidates, but only one can be the Democratic nominee. On Wednesday night, Democratic candidates went head-to-head -head in the fifth Democratic debate. During the debate, Senator Warren brought up student loan debt. Student loan debt. Right now in America, in America African Americans are more likely to borrow money to go to college, borrow more money while they're in college, and have a harder time paying that debt off after they get out. Today in America, a new study came out 20 years out Whites who borrowed money, 94% of them have paid off their student loan debt. 5% of African Americans have paid it off. I believe that means everyone on this stage should be embracing student loan debt forgiveness. It will help close the black-white wealth gap. Some of the candidates came over to the media room to address the press. PRN spoke with Senator Cory Booker after the debate to see how he will appeal to student voters. Uh, talking about the issues that they care about and having them involved in my campaign. We have a lot of young leaders right now. We need more. I hope more, more, uh, more young people in your, uh, on your campus will join our efforts and help to shape this campaign. Democratic National Committee Chair Tom Perez was one of many who attended the debate, and we Democratic spoke with him about how Atlanta, Democrats can win not only the presidential election, but also local elections as well. Not only win the presidential uh, here next year, but uh, we've got two Senate seats, we've got so many other opportunities, and Georgia is absolutely a battleground state. And here's how we win. We win by organizing everywhere. We win by leading with our values and talking about our commitment to making sure that everyone has access to quality, affordable health care, that we're in every community 
making sure we're building more schools, less prisons, making sure we're addressing gun violence, making sure we pass immigration reform, making sure we don't pit one group against another. That's what the other side does. Here at Tyler Perry Studios, I'm Tyreek Wynn, PRN. So the Georgia State football team came up short against App State this weekend. They did. We turn now to Dominic Taroski for the latest on the Georgia State versus App State game and the rest from around the campus. How's it going everyone? I'm Dominic Sharofsky and welcome back to Primetime. That's right Ashton, the Georgia State football team came up short in their biggest game yet, facing 24th ranked Appalachian State. The Panthers came out strong, taking a 21-7 lead against the Mountaineers in the first half. And then the second half started, where the Panthers were outscored 49-7. PRN's Nigel Butler spoke with Georgia State quarterback Dan Ellington following the game. Georgia State fell to Appalachian State this past weekend, 56 to 27, which now puts them three and three in the Sun Belt Conference, and they are now third place in the Eastern Division. We hear from Dan Ellington about this past weekend's tough loss. Uh, just forgetting about it. Uh, App State was a really good football team. Uh, they did some stuff, you know, to, to hurt us a little bit. But, uh, you know, just getting ready for South Alabama. Dan Ellington, who was questionable to even play this game against Appalachian State, ended up playing three quarters, finishing with 88 yards passing. We can arguably say that was one of Dan's lower performing games, but we questioned to see if this would be a factor in the upcoming game on Saturday against South Alabama. Yeah, yeah, I'll be fine. I came out, but just because of how the score was, it wasn't because of my my leg. It was it was nothing to do with my leg. Uh, they they told me, hey, let's let's uh, let's get you out this this uh, hat this quarter. Uh, let's win next week, and I agreed with them. Nigel Butler, PRN. It was indeed a heart wrenching loss for all those involved. Here's what head coach Sean Elliott had to say about it afterwards. We all witnessed something tonight that. It was incredible. Um, I mean, and I hope you paid attention. Because in this world today, <clears throat> in this day and age, you don't see it. But uh, for Dan Ellington to, to take the field tonight and, and do the things he did was extraordinary. Nothing short of amazing what that young man did. While the dream of a Sun Belt Championship may be over for the Panthers, the season isn't. This weekend, Georgia State will face off against the last place South Alabama Jaguars. In more football news, it was a media circus here in the city of Atlanta earlier this week as former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick came to the city to work out. Representatives from the Lions, Chiefs, Jets, Eagles, 49ers, Titans, and Washington were all in attendance as the former Super Bowl quarterback tested his arm for scouts and members of the media. Our own Tyreek Wynn was in attendance for the workout. Colin Kaepernick has just wrapped up his workout here at Charles Drew High School, and he had lots of NFL teams to come and look at his workout to see if he still has what it takes to be in the NFL. Now, some of you know he has been out of the league for a few years due to his nailing during the national anthem, but that could soon change. Here at Charles Drew High School, I'm Tyreek Wynn, PRN. The Georgia State volleyball team finished its regular season with back-to-back -back wins against rival Georgia Southern. These wins mean the Panthers will be heading to the Sun Belt Conference tournament later this week. Now, while the Panthers are heading to the tournament, this makes the eighth straight season in which the Georgia State volleyball team has finished under 500 in conference play. Reporter Crystal White has the details. Georgia State's women's volleyball team defeated rival Georgia Southern in four sets last Friday on senior night. Senior Malin Otts told me what it feels like to play in the sports arena one last time. It was phenomenal. It was just amazing to get a win in front of our home crowd against our rival. There's honestly nothing better. And with this group of girls, like it doesn't get much better than this. So how's the rivalry been over the years against Georgia Southern? We always go one and one with Southern. Like I think as long as I've been here, We've gone one and one, so being able to take two from them is amazing. Like, the rivalry is strong in all of our sports here, so it's just, it's one of the most fun games of the season. Crystal White, PRN. The Georgia State's men's basketball team fell short in both of their matchups this week. The first coming against number two ranked Duke as the Panthers fell 74 to 63. The other was a 91 to 83 loss to the Georgetown Hoyas. The Panthers came out strong, taking leads in the first half of both games. 
Georgia State opened the second half down just three against Duke and up six against Georgetown. But defensive lapses in the second half led to the Panthers coming up short in both games. While the Panthers' slow start is not what they hoped for, it is understandable. This team is an almost entirely new squad from last year's. The biggest change comes from the top, with new head coach Rob Lanier replacing former coach Ron Hunter. Lanier sat down with PRN's Keelan Berrien to talk about his journey to Georgia State University. You know, I played from a very young age. You know, I picked up a ball at six or seven years old, and it's been a part of my life ever since. Rob Lanier is the new head coach for the Georgia State University men's basketball team. He shares his love with the sport to mold young men to not only think like a champion, but play like one too. If we reach the potential that we have, we're going to do some great things. We need to keep getting better. And that goal becomes realistic. But if we can't advance, then it's a pipe dream. Rob Lanier played basketball majority of his life and been on the different side of the sport as a coach brought a lot of work. He shares that he has coached for many universities such as Niagara University, St. Bonaventure University, Rokas University, and many more. I had to work for a guy who gave me a lot of responsibility, and that really helped me to develop the passion for the profession. It kept me engaged, and it kept me around the players. I had to be the strength coach and the academic coordinator, and I was working on a, a master's degree, and it was one of the best experiences of my career. Lanier's decision for joining the Panther family was made from a vision that President Mark Becker had for the team. Uh, I was convinced through my interaction with them, they have a, a vision for the program that it was an opportunity that I couldn't turn away from. The vision that was shared with Lanier, his expectations for his players to try their best every day is high in order for that vision to come true. Some days may not be the best, but you have to learn to get back up. The passion of a coach is that you want guys to try to be their best every day. Part of the journey is being able to get back up and get back to work and, and, and continue to try to be the best version of yourself. And so um, that's our message to our players. Keelan Berrien, PRN. The Georgia State men's basketball team will face Prairie Review today at 730. Now it's time for the ladies. The Georgia State women's basketball team lost on Wednesday against crosstown rival Georgia Tech 69-28. This is the 16th straight loss the Lady Panthers have suffered at the hands of the Yellow Jackets. This loss also marks the second time in the past three years that the Panthers have started the season 0-3. The Georgia State women's basketball team will look to turn around their season this week as they face Alabama A&M on Tuesday. That's all we've got for you here this week on Primetime. Be sure to follow us at GSUPRN for all the latest updates and analysis. And we here want to wish you all a happy Thanksgiving next week. Now, back to you, Keelan. Thank you, Dominic. The Student Government Association had the Atlanta Senate meeting Thursday night. The Senate could not initially reach quorum due to the lack of senators present. And for more than 30 minutes, senators debated purchasing polos. Later, after a lengthy time of reviewing the previous meeting's minutes, Speaker of the Senate, Kaylin Thomas, had this to say to Senators. I am not up here for my help, okay? So right now, we're reading over the minutes, so I expect you to be reading over the minutes, not reading over whatever it is on your phone. Please try and pay attention. They later voted on a special order to move the establishment of a new student voice and feedback ad hoc committee to the Student Engagement Committee. The story has now made national headlines. New details of the tragic murder of Clark Atlanta student Alexis Crawford are released. Reporter Kara Nelson is live outside the Fulton County Courthouse where her ex-roommate had her bond hearing. Kara, what's the update? Yes, more details on the story that is shocking the nation on the death of the Clark Atlanta student, Alexis Crawford. Jordan Jones, her roommate, and Jones's boyfriend, Baron Brantley, are both being charged for the death of the 21-year-old. A judge denies Jones' bond Thursday morning at her hearing because prosecutors say she is a flight risk after evidence of her attempting to flee comes out. Also, a rape kit reveals Brantley's DNA inside of Crawford's body. Today, at their preliminary hearing, surveillance footage of the apartment shows the couple putting Crawford's body in the trunk of a car. Prosecutors say it seems the two are blaming each other for the death. It's such a tragic story. Outside of Fulton County Courthouse, Karen Nelson, PRN. Back to you guys. Now, this isn't a story that you hear every day. 
An Atlanta man goes from being homeless to a store owner on the street he used to sleep on. Reporter Karen Nesson has more on this amazing come up. Uh, the store was actually born out of a wheelchair, a wheelchair that I used to be in. I went from the wheelchair to eventually the bike and to what we have now, uh, uh, brick and mortar, big mouth being stores. After suffering from a crushed pelvis on the job, Benjamin Graham was confined to a wheelchair for a year until he was able to walk again. But after his recovery, he didn't say goodbye to the wheelchair. So I took that same wheelchair up and I turned it into a snack cart. This is how the store started. It's Big Mouth Ben. If you want to sell it, let me tell it. And people will put their flyers on the wheelchair as I walked around downtown selling snacks. As time passed, Ben started to sell snacks from his bike, but he had a feeling that he was destined for more. I um, struggled with addiction and mental illness throughout my life. I ended up sleeping under a bridge two blocks from here. And I had a spiritual awakening one day. I said, you know, it's got to be more to life than this. And, you know, I had a conversation with God. He received treatment and began working towards opening Big Mouth Bend stores on Auburn Avenue. And he showed how the seed of entrepreneurship was planted in him since he was a young boy. 15, 15, 16, 17. All right, appreciate it. Right. Have a good day. Snacks is just kind of a thing that kind of slid in, you know, in a way along my journey. Like I say, pushing a wheelchair around with snacks. And I'd be on the bus selling snacks. In school, I sold candy and snacks. So it's just something that's been with me most of my life. And he's still selling these same snacks today. But now he's offering hot foods, like hamburgers, the beef sausages, and hot dogs. Now, I didn't do all this by myself. Uh, my lovely college sweetheart, Tanya Graham, uh, we reunited 24 years from the time we met at college. And uh, we both teamed up and opened the store. And together, they have created a safe place for the community. Everybody's welcome in the store. Thank you for being kind of a senior citizen. Oh, no oh, problem. We, we love y'all. Appreciate it now. The yellow bike that sits outside and is displayed all around the store is not just a logo. It's also motivation. I made the bike yellow to represent the sunshine because I wanted to share my story with people to brighten their day. Locals say the store is an Auburn Avenue treasure. And Big Mouth Ben says he treasures sharing his story every day. In downtown Atlanta... Kara Nelson, PRN. A judge is declining murder charges on a security guard who fought a man at the 112 Cortland Apartments on October 27th. The man was later pronounced dead at Grady Hospital. PRN's Maya Grant is outside of the student apartment complex now. So Maya, can you give us more details about why the judge decided not to pursue charges? Yes, Ashton. The arrest warrant against the security officer Ian Miser has been denied. APD investigators released a statement saying, quote, Our investigators sought an arrest warrant for involuntary manslaughter over the weekend from magistrate court. A magistrate judge declined to allow us to pursue the warrants. As a result, we do not plan to pursue further charges at this time and are moving to close the case. The charges were denied based on not enough evidence and lack of probable cause to gain more evidence. Back to you guys in the studio. Thanksgiving is around the corner. Yes, it's less than one week away, and I'm so ready for my mom's good cooking. It's funny that you mentioned Thanksgiving food. A recent study conducted by Instacart through the Harris Poll asked 2,000 Americans about their feelings on the holiday's food. And to many people's surprise, a lot of Americans secretly hate Thanksgiving food. Wow, that's surprising. Yep. According to the poll, 29% don't like cranberry sauce, and green bean casserole follows closely behind with 24% of dislike. 22% don't want sweet potatoes, and get this, 19% don't like Thanksgiving turkey. Really? Yes. The poll says that although Americans don't prefer these foods, they still eat it anyway because it's Thanksgiving tradition. Well, I can agree with not liking turkey too much, but I love home-cooked meals, so Thanksgiving is still one of my favorite holidays. Yeah, mine too. I love dressing. Well, that's our show. Make sure you stay connected with Panther Report News throughout the week, and be sure to follow us on all social media platforms at GSU PRN. Also, subscribe down below and let us know what you think about the show. And enjoy your fall break. I'm Keelan Berrien. And I'm Ashton Gates. We'll see you soon.